If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. I don't want the kids I work with to have a mediocre adulthood. I want them to have a remarkable future. So how do we do that? And how do we help them have an awesome childhood on the way? I think a lot of times we get so caught up in stuff and kids have so many activities going on and there's just so much bombarding them that they're really struggling through their childhood, through their teen years, and then what do you think the pattern is gonna be when they're adults? That's what they've learned. So we wanna back up and say, what do they need? Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today I'm talking with Seth Perler, who describes himself as a renegade teacher turned executive function coach slash education coach. Seth helps struggling students navigate a crazy educational landscape and does his part to disrupt and improve education. His specialty is executive function and twice exceptional kids. This was such a fascinating conversation about all things executive functioning, and in fact, there was just so much more we wanted to cover that we're actually going to be doing a part two of the conversation very soon. If you have a child who has any executive functioning challenges, you will want to listen to this episode and also check out Seth's website at sethperler.com, which is full of resources for both parents and teachers. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And after you've listened to the episode, don't forget to check out my after the show video. Each week, I share a one to two minute video where I share my biggest takeaways from my podcast conversations or tips about taking what you've learned and making it work for your family. When you go to my after the show page, you can sign up to get new episodes of the podcast and this new series delivered to your inbox each week. You'll find that at tiltparenting.com slash after the show. And now here's my conversation with Seth. Hey, Seth, welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. I'm excited. We were just chatting before I hit the record button and we're going to be talking about executive functioning, which is something I know impacts most, if not all families who are part of the Tilt community. We've only covered one episode so far on this topic, and I know there's a lot to talk about, and I know it's very personal to you. So perhaps we could start by having you share with us some of your story and how you got involved in this work. Sure. Awesome. Well, first, I want to say thank you for what you do and just how you serve your community, but serve the world. Um, You're doing great work, and I just really want to put that out there. And so, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I don't know if you want to do this, but before we start, I'm interested from you because you've done, what, 75 or so episodes so far? Mm-hmm. Yep. What What is one of the biggest things you've learned? Can you identify like one takeaway? Oh, my goodness. I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but <laughs> I, I'm really curious. Like, is there one thing that you've has been a big takeaway for, for, for you? I have to say that I learned something in every episode and – Honestly, I I feel like I've done so much research and I've become an expert in who my child is and what his differences are. And I still get so much valuable insight out of everyone I talk to, even when I think I already know it all. And I think that that's probably the biggest takeaway. It's not a specific topic or concept, but it's more this idea that the learning really never does end. And it makes me feel like the luckiest person that I get to basically talk to amazing people around the world who are specialists in all these things I'm fascinated by. And I keep learning. It's really been cool. Mm, I love it. It's, it's somewhat daunting and overwhelming maybe for parents to know that 
there there are no easy answers. This the, these are complicated human beings we're trying to raise here. Absolutely. You know, thank you so much. Yeah, good question. So, um, my story. Do you want to hear my story as a kid or as a an adult? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, I'm okay. assuming that they're connected. Yeah, I was adopted and I um, grew up in a with this wonderful family in Columbus, Ohio, and I didn't look like a lot of my friends, but that's just because I had this white blonde hair as a boy. And I remember feeling a little bit different because of that, but really I started feeling different pretty young, like at five or six, I started feeling like I was different somehow. I could never put my finger on it. I didn't worry about it. I was a free spirited, creative kid. But something was was different. And that feeling um, ended up being problematic once I got to middle school and high school. But I started, quote, struggling in school when I was in first grade. My my progress reports literally in first grade started having comments about that. You know, if if, if Seth could just do this, uh, things would be OK. He's not paying attention. He's daydreaming. And I think that was probably for me the most consistent comment that ever came up was daydreaming, daydreamer, daydreamer, daydreamer. I had a wild imagination and I loved I loved going there. So um, but obviously that caused problems. So my grades started to suffer in middle school and high school, really in my junior year, my freshman and sophomore year, everything was fine because I could I could pull it off. I could do well on tests. I might be forgetting my homework or whatever, but how I compensated in my freshman and sophomore year, um, the compensate, the compensatory strategies I subconsciously used helped me do just fine and pull things off at the last minute. And, you know, but by the time junior and senior year came, things got hard and my grades really suffered. And then I had very high test scores. So I got into college on probation because my grades were so low. So <laughs> I uh, and then I had to take like a study skills course and two other courses at Ball State for my freshman summer. So I didn't even have summer break after senior year. Not a good plan, people. And um, I got an A in study skills and two C's. So they let me go on to fall semester and then I failed out. Fall semester I failed. Spring semester I failed. And they said, do not come back. So I got into another college and then I failed. They were on quarters. I failed quarter one, failed quarter two, and then I dropped out for the spring. And I felt like a failure and I felt like I couldn't do anything right. I felt like school was useless. And I really um, had these grandiose dreams of owning an island or something when I was an adult. Yet I had no capacity to execute on things that would get me my goal, you know. So I really suffered. I really uh, felt like a failure inside. I hated me. I hated Seth. And I would put on a good show on the outside that I, you know, that things were okay. But I really was suffering very deeply. So eventually things got worse and worse until one day I decided, you know what, I'm going to give it everything I have and try to turn my life around and see what happens. And I did it and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And uh, it worked. And somehow I accidentally just got a job um, from the newspaper. At the time, we used to have these things called newspapers. <laughs> and I remember uh, those. Yeah. And you'd look through these little ads and I found a job working with kids. It was just a job. I didn't care about it. But after six months of doing that, I was absolutely hooked. I loved it. I loved complicated kids. I loved kids who struggled. I loved problem solving. I loved seeing them change. And I uh, devoted my life, the rest of my life, to uh, being of service to kids. Ended up going back to school, became a teacher, taught for 12 years, got a master's in gifted and talented. And um, I'm sure it's no surprise, my favorite kids were the 2E kids that struggled. Yeah. So I uh, left teaching after 12 years and getting a bit frustrated with the, quote, system and feeling limited in terms of being able to serve kids. I really wanted to serve as powerfully as I felt I was born to. And I created this little business for the last seven or eight years. And here I am. And I get now what I do is I get to uh, serve specifically students who struggle with executive function. Most are 2E and many have diagnoses like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, but I don't really care about any of that. I like the kids who struggle with executive function. That's the common denominator. 
Wow. Thank you for sharing this story. It's really powerful, incredible story. And it heartbreaking at the same time. I mean, to hear you say that you hated yourself is, I know for so many people listening too. you know, that's our biggest fear is that our kids are going to feel so bad about who they are, that they're going to sink to that place. And I'm just curious, you know, I, I want to hear so much about the work that you're doing. But when you were younger, did you know what was going on with you? I mean, did you have any sort of diagnosis? Did you just feel like you weren't fitting in with in in a vacuum that you didn't have insight to that? Good question. Now I know that I had inattentive ADD, ADHD, and I maybe there were other things going on with um, birth trauma from adoption. I have no idea, honestly. Um, I know I started having anxiety when I was in middle school, but they tested me for learning disabilities in seventh or eighth grade because, like I said, my progress reports always said the same thing. Doesn't apply himself it is the, or they implied it lazy, not trying, could do so much better. And when they tested me for learning disabilities, they said there are no learning disabilities. In fact, he's got a high IQ. Um, so my parents were really baffled. And there was no such thing as inattentive ADHD. There was just, at the time, hyperactivity. But I didn't have that. So it was sort of then. And I see the same patterns now, actually, with a lot of kids, whether or not they're diagnosed. But the message is that you're not motivated you you don't try hard enough, you don't care about school, and you're lazy. These, so what I call the lies, because they don't take into account what's going on with executive function. But I really didn't know. And the first time I had any diagnosis, I was a teenager, I don't remember, 14 or 15, and I was diagnosed as bipolar. And I honestly don't know if that Um, You know, I don't think I would be diagnosed bipolar today by any means, but at the time, that's what the testing showed. Now, was that being 2E and was did it did it look like bipolar? Because there's a lot of, you know, misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, overdiagnosis of all kinds of things. So getting a, a good diagnosis from a good neuropsych is is it's hard to find a lot of times. So, yeah, especially with kids who have multiple things going on. We've had uh, an expert on the show, Devin McEachern, who we talked about that, and she specializes in two week kids, but there it can get really complicated to really understand what is a result of what and what is influencing. And is this a symptom of ADD or profound yep. giftedness? Or, you know, it, it all kind of it does, it gets messy. And I imagine I'm. I won't put you on the spot and ask how old you are, but I imagine that when you were in school, there was just there wasn't the awareness that we have today. There's not enough today, even, but back 20 years ago or so, there just wasn't a lot of information about. A, I'm certain executive functioning was not on people's radar. Yeah, no, they they really like I said, they didn't even there was no such thing as inattentive ADD or anything like that. So. They had no idea. And what you're referring to with like the two E kids, I call that super asynchronous. Like the if you were to say that there's even a spectrum within two E kids of more two E and less two E kids, the kids who are super two E are super asynchronous. Their their scores are so all over the place and their behaviors are so all over the place. It's it's really difficult to identify things. But that also does bring you back to why it's such a good thing to go from the executive function frame because it helps you to get so we can diagnose all day long but if you can get to what needs to happen to help the student launch a great future well what needs to happen is they have to have executive function skills they have to be able to execute tasks whether it's cleaning a bedroom filling out a college application a job application writing a paper doing a project checking their grades self-advocacy Anything that they have to do that's good for their future requires executive function. So it's nice that you can have and parents get very concerned about the diagnoses, but to really focus on great. This is all great. But now what do we do about it? Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment, so we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things. And that absolutely includes mealtimes. At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. 
Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. I think the first time I really heard the term was when we had done a second round of assessments for my son. He's now 13. But when he was eight, we did a second round of assessments. And he got autism spectrum disorder was one of his diagnoses along with ADD, and some other goodies. He also has a very high IQ. But I remember very clearly the woman who was giving us this information said, you know, the key to him living independently and having the life that he wants is going to be executive functioning, getting him those the support to develop those skills now, starting now. And I was like, okay, we'll do whatever, (laughs) whatever we need to do, we'll do. But even within that, it's really complicated Mm -hmm. to figure out what to do. And that's where you come in, you know, but Before we even get into how to support that, could you give us an overview of what executive functioning is, how you define it in your work? Sure. Um, First, I'll mention that there are – you can look up what is executive function on the internet and look up the first two or three or four definitions. And what you're going to find is a bunch of mumbo-jumbo psychobabble. And I don't mean to say that in a bad way. The experts who have written these definitions are, they're articulating it perfectly, but it is not in layman's terms. And parents and teachers cannot access what the heck they're talking about. So to me, when I talk about executive function, I like to break it down into simple terms. And in simplest terms, executive function is the ability to get things done. Now, executive function is a problem when students have to get things done that they don't feel like getting done. Obviously, if they are going to do something that's of high interest, like video games, hobbies, social things, they execute just fine. So they can learn to execute in areas where they've practiced a lot and have high interest. But when it's other things, like I was mentioning before, cleaning a bedroom, writing a paper, doing a project, managing a planner, things like that, then the exe- being able to execute those tasks is very difficult. So to define executive function further, 
Um, executive function involves the, the front part of the brain and the front part of the brain helps you to execute these tasks. And in order to execute any task, you have to do many things. You have to be able to realistically plan what you are doing. And as we well know, a lot of the students that we work with ha do not perceive time realistically, nor do they perceive the amount of energy that is required to do something realistically. For example, getting out the, out of the door in the morning or doing homework, they'll say, oh, it'll take five minutes, you know, and it takes an hour and a half. So being able to plan effectively and understand the chunks or the pieces, the bite-sized pieces that are required to accomplish a complicated task, that's part of executive function. Time management is part of executive function. Organizing your time, organizing your space, your materials, your school materials, organizing your thoughts, that's part of executive function. Prioritizing is part of executive function. Some people prioritize really well and say, oh, I got to get my homework done, get it out of the way. That way I can feel like I'm free to enjoy my night. Well, kids with executive function struggles do not prioritize that way. They want to put the not fun things off as long as possible and get to the fun things. But prioritization um, inhibition is part of executive function, which means being able to hold back appropriately, like your emotions or your thoughts or your actions. Um, I'm not saying to hold back your emotions in a negative way, but there's a time and a place for things. Um, so being able to inhibit yourself, and that has a lot to do with regulation. In fact, all of this does. Um, being able to focus, pay attention, concentrate, that's part of executive function. Being able to do what's called task initiation. So to be being able to self start, being able to not procrastinate. A lot of people think of this as motivation, but I have a problem with the word motivation. Maybe I'll talk about that today, maybe not. But task initiation means how do we get started? How, and that is such a huge problem because if they never start executing, they never finish executing, they have a lot of missing and incomplete assignments, their grades don't reflect their ability. Task persistence just means follow through. Uh, working memory means being able to juggle um, lots of things. A lot of these kids think they have great, such exceptional working memory that they can remember all their homework and not need a planner. <laughs> and we know that that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, executive function has to do with attention to detail, being reflective or metacognitive or introspective, being able to look back and say, how did that work for me? What can I change? Kids with weak executive function don't do that. Now, kids with strong executive function really learn, quote, learn from their mistakes. These kids generally are not self-aware or conscious or mindful of things, at least not things that are going to help change their behavior. And then emotional regulation is one of the biggest ones. And that's where a lot of avoidance and resistance comes from. They don't know how to regulate their stress and their anxiety, and they, they become overwhelmed and av avoid and resist. So that was a great list. I actually wrote them all down just because it helps me organize what you're saying. But as I was writing them down, and some of them I don't think I realized were executive functions, like, you know, the time management, the planning, the organizing, the task initiation are ones I'm familiar with. But when you talk about the emotional regulation, that to me, and, and many of these actually, it seems like there's so much overlap with other neuro differences. And so could, could you talk a little bit about that? Is it possible to have executive function challenges and not have another neuro difference? Do executive function challenges always correspond? You know, if, if you, for example, do have an autism diagnosis, are you going to have executive functioning deficits? Mm, good question. Um, yeah, the, the list that I just gave you is my list. So you'll have different experts who will, some people will say there are five aspects, some people will say there are 10, people break them into different things. The way that I have chosen to break them down is I always go back to the practical and I'm looking at how do these things, I, I want to put it in, in words that describe how do these things affect students on a day-to-day -day basis in their real life and how do they help or interfere with being able to, I use the metaphor of launch, launch a great future after high school or college. So as far as um, executive function with autism, it's going to present differently, but everybody has executive function. It just It's part of the brain. We all execute. It's like having a nervous system or a circulatory system or a skeletal system. It just, it's like everybody's skeletal system is different. And these aspects of executive function, if you were to put all of these aspects on a chart and have a measurement for each of them, 
everybody would have different measurements in these different areas. So somebody with, for example, ADHD would have much more trouble with inhibition, with holding back, with, quote, controlling yourself. Whereas somebody, somebody with autism, for example, may have a much easier time executing when they're clear on what the task is. And just especially if it's a routine um, or habit that they've already gotten. I see. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, I, I understand. But I think I asked that question because this is something so many of us grapple with. I, I just interviewed for the podcast, Carol Kronowitz, who wrote The Out of Sync Child. And it's a question I asked her too, mm. you know, that overlap between sensory processing challenges and these other diagnoses. Sometimes it's just hard to understand, you know, where our focus should be, where our energy should be in terms of supporting our kids. But from what you've said and what I know, executive functioning really is at the top of the list, regardless of the diagnosis. Yeah. And when you're looking at the aspects of it, and maybe would it be helpful if I made sort of a little assessment for those aspects for your audience? Yeah, that would be great. I can, I'll do that and I'll make it with some sort of chart that they can self-assess and fill in so they can visually see. But, um, when I'm looking at a, a, a student that I'm working with, I work with middle, high school, and college usually. And when I'm looking at them, I'm not. I'm obviously I've been doing this a long time, so I, my brain filters the stuff very fast. And there's so much overlap. But what I'm really looking for, if I if I were to slow down my brain and tell you, what I'm really looking for is of the aspects of executive function that they struggle with, which ones should we attack that are going to make the most difference? Because it has a domino effect. When you start working with certain routines, habits, um, or approaches to navigating school and life, that will help make other aspects of executive function easier. So I'm really looking for what are those sort of golden nuggets that are going to get me the most bang for the buck in terms of helping them have a better quality of life. That's great. That makes perfect sense. So in the notes that you sent me ahead of this conversation, because again, there's so much we could talk about and listeners, just so you know, Seth and I have already discussed doing a part two. So if you're left wanting more, send me uh, questions that you want me to, to approach Seth with, and we'll cover them in another episode. But one of the things that you said that jumped out at me is that it's important to revisit the purpose of education before talking about how to really help kids. And you said that you're big on zooming out. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, a lot of times we, meaning adults, get really caught up in planning for college and test scores and grades and missing assignments and, um, well, you didn't finish this. And we get, we get really focused on these details that may be important, but we lose sight of what are we doing here in the first place. I'm a very big picture person. So every person I work with, I'm always zooming out to what the heck are we doing here? Because it's a balance. But if you always have that in the background, then that can drive your decision making and it can drive the the way you approach having conversations with your child and the way you approach advocating for your child in school or the way you communicate with teachers. So to me, the purpose of education is the launch. And the launch, as I was mentioning before, is, is how do we take this? We, we have an infant, right? We have this little beautiful baby. And how are we going to take them and give them what they need so that they can have an independent, awesome future where they're able to go for their dreams and their goals and their hopes? And I'm not trying to sound woo-woo. I'm being very real. Like, how are we going to help these people have a remarkable life? I don't want the kids I work with to have a mediocre adulthood. I want them to have a remarkable future. So how do we do that and how do we help them have an awesome childhood on the way? I think a lot of times we get so caught up in stuff and kids have so many activities going on and there's just so much bombarding them that they're really struggling through their childhood, through their teen years. And then what do you think the pattern is going to be when they're adults? That's what they've learned. So we want to back up and say, what do they need? And what they need is they need to be able to execute sometimes things that they don't want to do. They need to be able to advocate when things are too much. They need to learn. And this is a skill. It takes time. They need to be able to learn to say, you know what, teacher, this is not working for me. Like, I want to show you that I'm learning, but 
I just spent three hours on this last night. I need to have a life. This is not okay. You know, and that takes time and that takes parental involvement, but they need to have the skills to execute and to self-regulate and to be metacognitive, to be able to check in with themselves. These are all related, of course, in order to be able to launch, whether they do gap years, whether they go into career after high school, whether they go to college, whether they do any number of things, they need to be able to execute in order to accomplish any future goals. And kids will always say, well, not always, but a lot of kids will say, well, I don't, especially teenagers, well, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I don't, you know, they're so consumed with the short term and whatever their hobbies are and um, stuff like that. They're like, I really don't know. And I'm like, I get it, but you do know that you want to be happy and successful, whatever that means. So, and that's the number one thing I've heard from parents over 20 years of working with kids is I just want my kids to be happy, healthy, and successful. So my question has always been, what the heck does that mean, ha happy and successful? And I'll wrap up with this. So I've broken that down into four areas. Again, my brain is very big picture, but what is a happy human being? So my geeky brain has come up with like these four circles that overlap and there are four areas of life and the more they overlap and the, the healthier each circle is, the more quote happiness they have. This is just my own little paradigm. But those four areas are cognitive, or you could consider that mental. Are they mentally stimulated, involved, engaged in things that interest them, that are meaningful to them? Physical, sleep, nutrition, exercise, and self-care. Are they physically healthy? Um, emotional, are they emotionally healthy and know how to regulate emotion, know how to deal with difficult emotions? Not perfectly, but do they have tools for that? And socially, do they know how to create new relationships, end unhealthy relationships, maintain healthy relationships, and you know, be a part of a community, have a sense of belonging, have this social. So social, emotional, cognitive, and physical. And when those four things are, there's a lot of wellness in those, then you have a quote, for lack of a better term, happy person. So the reason I, I like that is because, again, it helps zoom out and be like, what the heck are we doing here? How is this affecting them emotionally? If they're super dysregulated with something that's going on with school, like let's say a kid has conflict with a teacher. A lot of times I have students where you probably see this a lot, too, where there's a teacher that just doesn't get these kids. They're a very highly organized person. They think they're doing the kids a favor by saying, I'm just holding them accountable and I'm just trying to teach them responsibility. Yet the kid does not have anywhere near the skills that are necessary yeah. to do what the teacher's asking. <laughs> and the kid ends up just feeling resentful and punished. So there's an emotional regulation problem. It helps you zoom out and be like, okay, they're, they're most emotionally dysregulated by even thinking about this teacher. Let's attack that. How do we deal with that? So anyhow, sorry for going on a bit of a rant with that, but it's so important to zoom out and be, and be very clear on what you're doing before you make a decision about uh, how to make an intervention for a child. Well, I think that's great. I, I appreciate you sharing your ideas around what it takes to be happy. I, it's a nice reminder to have. And also, the zooming out in education, as you were talking about that, I was thinking a lot of us in the TILT community are homeschooling our kids, not because that was what we wanted to do, but because we felt maybe at some point that we didn't have a choice or for whatever reason, it seems like the best option for our kids. And I think for parents who are homeschooling, we have a lot more freedom and flexibility within that model to support a child's executive functioning development in a way that feels good for them and not like a punishment. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts for parents who are in the school system, you know, whose kids are going through a traditional educational model and more so today than ever, there's just such a expectation of the amount of work and the homework and the group projects. And, you know, there's so much pressure on these kids. How can parents within that model advocate for their kids and kind of keep that big picture, that zoomed out picture in mind? I'm sure you work with a lot of families like this. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. 
That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. That's a great question. So there's a lot of different ways to approach answering that question. One practical way when kids get in middle, when kids get in high school and college and they start being able to pick their schedules, one practical thing that I recommend over and over and over is less stuff on the schedule. And parents argument or the students argument is, but I need that class so that it looks good on a college transcript. Well, I don't, I'm personally, I don't care. I care about your well-being now. Like people get so obsessed with these things at the expense of their child's well-being or the child themselves at their expense of their own well-being. They're packing on so any given class, if you have a school year of 180 days, any given class is going to be at least 180 more hours of mental attention demanded in your life. Now that doesn't even include homework. So let's say you have an hour of homework in that class each night. That's 360 additional hours in a school year that your mind has to be consumed with that class realistically. And these kids are not realistic. They need time for self-care. They need time for family. They need time for fun. They need time for friends. And so one of the practical things I say is, you know, if you can cut a course off of next year or take an easier course, but it won't look good on my transcript. Well, look, if your life is balanced, I'm not going to be having this conversation with you. But if it's not and you're struggling in life, I'm going to really say, let's look at what we can remove because removing one class again can be like 360 hours that you can use for, you know, working on higher quality work for other classes or self-care, et cetera. So that's one thing. Number two, this is just a sidebar. I want to mention, I am cynical about our education system, but do not get me wrong. I love teachers and appreciate teachers. They are in a system that is outdated and that needs improvement and needs changes. So it may sometimes sound like I'm cynical about teachers. Most teachers are awesome human beings who are invested in your child's life. Yeah, yeah. A few of them really need to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's a few in the gray area in between, but the vast majority are extraordinary people who are dedicated to your kid and they need, you need to give them a break and, and you're on the same team, you know? So most teachers get that. Yes. The system. I mean, I appreciate you saying that it, it's the system that needs to be changed more than anything. Yeah. 
yeah, we, we need great teachers. They, they keep all of this afloat. They're the ones who, you know, if you have a great teacher, your child comes home or even years after the teacher, they're like, yeah, I remember Miss Smith. She, she really helped me and or made me feel good about myself. They may not remember anything from the class, but feeling empowered is everything. So the other thing I would say to parents who are in this, in this situation is I think that there is a lot of systemic dysfunction that manipulates people. And I don't think people, there's like some, you know, hidden society that's arranging all this. But one of the things that I see is that there's a lot of parental shame and guilt. And one of the shaming messages parents hear is helicopter parent, and nobody wants to be labeled a helicopter parent. And I think that in a dysfunctional way, what that does is it holds people back from saying their truth. So if a parent comes in and they say, you know what, I need to advocate for my kid, we need to work on this, and they feel shamed somehow, there's a lot of times there's something going on. A lot a lot of times you go in there and teachers are like, cool, what's up? How can I help? And a lot of times people are like, this is how we do it. You know, comply, 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 keep your mouth shut. So my thing is advocate, advocate, advocate. Listen to your gut over your head, parents. Like if your head is telling you, um, you know, I don't want to be a helicopter parent. I don't want to overstep my bounds, whatever. That school is there to serve your child. That's who the service is for. Okay. And sometimes we forget that. So your child is being served. Advocate, advocate, be the squeaky wheel, be the squeaky wheel, be the squeaky wheel. Do not back down. Okay. If you, if you're like, wow, I feel like I'm crazy. Am I the only one who sees this? No, you're not. How do I know that? Probably like Debbie, because I hear stories behind the scenes all the time, the same stories over and over. You're not the only one. You're not crazy. Listen to your gut. And sometimes if you need to, you can get, you know, professional advocate. So that is such a great reminder. As you're talking, I was thinking of two books that I really love. And Jessica Leahy's book, The Gift of Failure, which I talk a lot about on the show. And then Julie Lightcott Hames book, How to Raise an Adult. And Mm -hmm. And I think this is something I struggle with. And I'm sure many parents do is this idea that we agree in theory, right, with all of these concepts, we do want our kids to be independent and to be remembering their own homework. And we don't we want to help them kind of, quote, unquote, fail in safe ways so they can learn from it. But it's that reminder that our kids need more scaffolding. And I just appreciate you saying that and kind of giving permission for us to know that it's okay to advocate for what our kids need in a system that just isn't set up right now to support who they are. No, it's set up for people in the middle of the bell curve and (laughs) differently wired kids are by their very nature outliers. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. So Seth, I, gosh, I feel like we're just scratching the surface and what (laughs) I really want to get into and, and I'm going to ask you while I'm recording you, if you'll come back and do this, but absolutely, I would love to, to end the conversation now, but bring you back on to get kind of strategic. I really want to learn about how you work with people, how you work with kids, the services that you offer, and also share with parents some tips about what things they can be doing at home to support their kids' executive functioning. So now that I've put you on the spot, that's something you're up for doing? Yeah. And can I mention one thing related to that? Yes, please. So there's a lot. So we didn't get to the most important thing, which is the solutions. H- how do we do this? So to put it in one word philosophically. So there are a lot of details that I'll come back on and I'll explain the details of how I do this. But philosophically, what you want to be thinking today is what the word I call it Franken study. So what Franken study means is, is a lot of times when we're trying to help kids learn how to navigate this stuff, we're using traditional ideas, traditional ways, things like three ring binders and tutors. And we're just we're not really thinking we're just kind of doing what we were taught or what works for us, especially if we're an organized adult. That's doesn't work for disorganized kids. So the idea of Franken study is I want you to kind of forget everything you think you know about what your kid needs in terms of systems for school and really think what works for them, what systems do work for them. And if it's not what they've been taught by their teacher or by you, start to modify that in Franken study and change it to customize it and personalize it for them. 
So that's kind of all of the things that I do have to do with how do we tailor it to you? Not how do I have the whole class have a three ring binder system and every single person does the same standardized thing, but how do we customize it for your brain so that if you can at least have that concept in the back of your head, maybe you can question your own thinking and in the systems and you can look at things through that lens. So you can say, oh yeah, well that actually works for my child when I, when we do this at home, when it comes to getting teeth brushed. So why don't we apply a similar system for homework or something like that? So that's great. And that's, I think, enough to help get people started. It's something I advocate a lot. And I talk a lot about in my book that's coming out next year is this idea that you need to question everything you thought you knew about parenting. Mm -hmm. And this is another place where we need to apply that. Seth, First of all, wow, I'm just so excited. I'm excited to talk with you and continue this conversation. This has been so helpful. And listeners, Seth's website is fantastic. It's sethperler.com. I will include links in the show notes for how to get in touch with Seth. He has a lot of resources on his website, and I encourage you to, to check that out and learn more about how Seth works. And then I'll just say thank you and to be continued. Thank you, Debbie. This has been so much fun. Thanks for what you're doing. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, visit tiltparenting.com slash podcast and search for this conversation. If you like what you heard on today's episode, I would be grateful if you could take a minute to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating or a review. Thank you so much for helping us stay visible so people who would benefit from the show can easily find it. If you want to support the show and help me cover the cost of production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. To support the show, just visit patreon.com slash Tilt Parenting. Lastly, if you aren't already part of the online community at Tilt, I invite you to sign up at tiltparenting.com on the box in the bottom where it says join the revolution. Every Thursday, I send out a short email with a quick note from me, a link to that week's podcast episode, and links to five stories from the news that week that are relevant to parents like us. Again, you can sign up and learn more about Tilt at www.tiltparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Ko, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.